Samma So, right now, I encourage everybody to observe the state of mind you're in, your, what is your mood, your emotion of this moment. Being the knowing, being the puto observing, it's like this. At this, here and now, the place is here, the time is now. And this is, this is reality, it's here and now. Tomorrow, ask yourself, what is tomorrow right now? It's uh, possibility, it's expectation, hope, it might be dread, worry, And so it's just to to explore time, the, the what time is in reality, is there's only the here and now, the Pachubana Dhamma. And, and right now, tomorrow is possibility. It's the unknown. So just the perception of tomorrow or the future you're, this is this is developing using wisdom to investigate this realm that we're living in because we see it in in terms of conditioning in a set pattern a cultural uh, conditioning of personal uh, experience personal identities so we we see it always through very worldly perceptions that distort reality. <clears throat> but at this moment, this here and now, tomorrow is the unknown. You don't know. It's, but it's possibility, maybe hope, expectation, might be dread or fear, anxiety. But there's the knowing now that, it, that tomorrow, you don't know tomorrow. And then ask yourself, what is yesterday, right now? Because we're experiencing the, the presence, the Dhamma here and now, using Sati Sambhachanya, mindfulness, intuitive awareness, our perception, wisdom. What is the reality of yesterday in the present? It's, it's a memory, isn't it? You remember yesterday I did this, I said that. So the past is a memory in the present. And a memory is a sankara. It's a, it's a, it arises and ceases according to other conditions. Possibility. Uh, expectation, hope for the future, dread for the future is a sankara. It's a mental creation in the present. It arises and ceases. So it's like informing your consciousness with wisdom, panya or wisdom, universal wisdom, 
the way things are. No longer just taking for granted that tomorrow you'll do this and and next year you go there. I mean, these are, we can plan for the future. There's nothing wrong with that. But right now, we're taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, which means we're no longer operating just from daily life perceptions and habit patterns that we're uh, identified with, but we're investigating them, seeing them in terms of Dhamma of reality rather than going along with these basic delusions and never questioning, never investigating ourselves, our lives, the experience of life. So the past is a, like right now, this is only the here and now. Experience is now. This is experience. What you're experiencing right now is it called experience. And, and tomorrow you might, you know, you expect maybe to experience something. Or yesterday you experienced something you remember. But there's only the here and now, the Pachubana Dhamma is reality. So that's why the Buddha, in his first sermon, didn't teach about getting something in the future, practicing now to get the result in the future, or talk about the past, but pointing to like dukkha, the, f the first noble truth of suffering. Because that's happening now. It's, it's, not a, it's not theoretical. It's not about, you know, the, the philosophical or metaphysical. It's, it's awakening to the present moment is like this. And the sense of a self, the, the ego, the sakyaditi, the identity that we hold with, uh, uh, with identifying with the bodies we have, with the memories we have, with the habits, with the emotions. All this is conditioned. These are conditions. They're conditioned. They're sankharas. They are what they are. Uh, sankharas can be coarse or refined, good or bad, beautiful or ugly. <clears throat> but they're all this, they, but this in the, the Buddha emphasized the common characteristic of all phenomena is anicca, dukkha, anatta, the three characteristics of existence. Now, in, in, in Vipassana meditation, with, like the samatha practices are concentrating on an object. So you have a, an object, the breath, for example, anapanasati, <clears throat> you concentrate on the inhaling, exhaling movements of the breathing of your body. So there's always, in samatha meditation, an object. You focus on an object to the exclusion of everything else. And this tends to calm the, the, uh, the thinking, wandering mind. As you focus on one object, rather than just proliferate and think and, and get carried away with your feelings and emotions that arise, you, 
you focus on one object at, and exclude everything else. Vipassana, the name of Vipassana or insight meditation is to look into the nature of phenomena. <clears throat> so it, it's not focusing on one object because all phenomena is impermanent. And so the, the uh, Vipassana practice is uh, Sati Sampachanya, which is uh, including everything. All conditions are impermanent. All Dhamma is not self. Now, when we, the uh, samatha practices, we start with because that's what we're used to. That's what we, we've learned to concentrate when we read a book or, or drive a car. There's a level of concentration necessary to be focused on, on the thing in front of you. <clears throat> so we've, we've developed that kind of practice in the samatha practices, they're, they're not using interesting objects or that, but that which is tends towards calm, towards equanimity, towards one-pointedness, peacefulness. So, like the the breathing of your body is is uh, if you concentrate on it, so that you're with the rising, ceasing, the inhaling, exhaling, the breath tends to calm down, even seem to vanish. You experience uh, equanimity, a kind of calm, tranquility. And that's uh, just training the mind in, in skillful ways. It's like yoga exercises or Tai Chi. It's, it's, it's good to d develop mental uh, skills as well as physical uh, skills through, through various exercises. But the liberating exercise is uh, vipassana, insight practice. So the Four Noble Truths are about looking into, you know, investigating. Uh, they have this Pali word, Yoniso Manasikara, getting to the root cause. And this the Buddha, by taking uh, the ordinary experience of dukkha, of suffering, something that's ordinary, that, that doesn't, and you're not using it to lead toward tranquility, but towards insight. So, since this is a common experience to all creatures, the human species, the human species, we have this reflective mind or Buddha-type mind. What is a Buddha mind? What, what is the difference? Why can't a, a cat or a dog reflect on its behavior? in uh, monasteries and remember at Amravati trying to to intimidate the cats not to kill the birds with moral fears you know this is a very bad practice to kill no matter how much you love the cat and no matter how convincing and threatening you can be it's nature's to kill birds it <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's made for. <laughs> That's the species, isn't it? You know, they're vegetarian, cows eat grass. Other animals kill other animals and eat meat and so forth. And this is, this is the species. Uh, different species need different types of food. And, these are just the natural tendencies of a species. Now we're this thing we're we're mammalian species. We share 
a commonality, say, with all mammals. They have the same uh, kind of instincts of procreation, survival. We have, you know, why, why do human beings like dogs so much? What is it there about the species of dogs that, that we can relate? Because emotionally, they're quite like us. You can hurt their feelings by yelling at them. <laughs> dogs get jealous and get angry. They, when they get happy, they're very happy. So they have feelings, but they don't have retentive memory. Like the, the animal world, it, it has a memory, but it doesn't, it doesn't think about last year. <clears throat> it doesn't have the Buddha ability, the Buddha mind to reflect. And so when we make Buddha rupas, we, we can make them in a, in a human form, like the, the one here behind me is, is actually taking an iconic human form. And in the Buddhist world, you know, this is the, the iconic form of Buddha rupa is a very, is a very peaceful form. Those of you who live with Buddha Rupas, you know, they tend to, they don't tend to stimulate desire or passions because they're the form either, whatever posture they're in, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, whatever mudras, whatever hand movements they're making, it's all about blessing or peace or, or concentration. Uh, the samadhi Buddha rupas, you notice they're they're composed, but they're not closing their eyes. They're not blocking up their ears. They're not like the three monkeys: hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Their their senses are open, receptive, calm, mindful. And so this is, this is a unique icon to uh, Buddhism itself. <clears throat> and you don't find this, this icon in the, in the Western world. And uh, my sister is an is a icon artist. She paints, she's a devout Roman Catholic, and she, she's very well known in west coast of the United States for painting icons. And they're beautiful. They're beautifully done. The kind of Byzantine style. <clears throat> uh, very kind of, uh, you know, stylized type of uh, figures of saints, of Jesus. <clears throat> but there, but there's, no, there's no icon that represents this, this this mindful wisdom that the Buddha Rupa exemplifies. When you go and visit, like I was in, many years ago I was visiting Paris. We were in the area of the Eiffel Tower and that very touristed area where they have these these kind of grand uh, figures of uh, kings and and knights riding on horses and emperors with swords and empresses all looking very haughty and arrogant. The women are usually you know like queens or they they're not peaceful looking they look very uh, like they they're haughty and think, you know, their noses are in the air. And, <laughs> and the male figures are all warriors, you know, muscular and with, with uh, weapons. They're beautifully done, beautifully sculpted figures. And then we went into the Gimei Museum, which is in that area where they have the uh, Oriental art collection. And, and of course, Paris, come 
with, uh, you know, used to colonize Cambodia. So they have some of the most beautiful Cambodian uh, Khmer uh, Angkor Wat period um, Buddha Rupas there, and they they set them off with beautiful lighting. And you go in the Gimei Museum, and you just feel like you've entered kind of like an oasis of calm because of these these beautiful Kem, uh, Khmer Buddha Rupas just uh, have the most uh, beautiful, peaceful faces, head. Some of, sometimes there's only the head of a uh, decapitated um, Buddha Rupa. <laughs> but even that, the, the head of a Khmer Buddha Rupa is extraordinarily beautiful. And when you look at it, it has an effect on your consciousness. Notice how how body language, the way someone walks or holds themselves, has has an effect on on what we uh, emotionally experience. And this is just the way it is. Where this is what sensitivity is about. Sensitivity is not about <clears throat> how things should be. Uh, it's not idealistic because we have to live in the realm of here and now, where things are what they are. And the ideals of the perfect, of a utopian society where everything is what it should be, is the future. It's the unknown, it's potential, it's possibility, it's ideal. But we as living, breathing, sensitive forms, human beings, have to experience our experience always is here and now, with the way it is. <clears throat> Both internally, the way you are, your, your, your health, your physical condition, your age determines what you're experiencing. The environment around you affects you. Whether it's here at, at Bodhiwana Monastery or in the middle of a traffic jam in Melbourne, it, you, you feel it, you know, this is what sensitivity is about. It's not about the ideals of how we would like Melbourne to be or the Bodhiwana Monastery, but it, it is the way it is. And notice that the Buddha was emphasizing the, the characteristic of impermanence. So impermanence is not a, a criticism or uh, it's not comparing one sankara with another. And some are better than others and bigger and smaller. It's, it's all, all sankaras are impermanent. So in that way, it makes it much more easy for us. Because uh, the sankaras are, you know, they're repulsive, they're horrifying, they're fascinating, they're magnificent, they're splendid, they have, they're boring, they're mediocre. They, they have so many qualities, permutations of pleasant, uh, being pleasant or unpleasant, good or bad, beautiful or ugly. that we, we get whirled away in, in our own emotional reactions of, of being intimidated by the qualities of, by the experience of here and now, by the, the, the physical sensation of sitting, by breathing, by, uh, you know, whether you're too hot or too cold or you're feeling uh, well or sickly. In a, in a monastery like this, it's set up to, to create the, a, a, a useful atmosphere of tranquility. So you notice it is not highly decorated with a lot of distracting images. Uh, you want more like simplicity because we don't want to, we don't come to, to the monastery to be entertained to be distracted by looking, it's not like going to an art museum or a show where you go for 
distraction, for entertainment. But uh, the monastery is, is aimed to be a place where you come to, to meditate, to reflect on Buddha's teaching. We come to Bodhiwana Monastery to, to make merit, to tamboon, to, to listen to the, the monks, listen to Dhamma. So in a monastery like Bodhiwana is a, is a great gift in, uh, to the general public because um, places like this are appreciated in a, in a world, in a materialistic society that, that is um, hell-bent on distracting you through arousing, exciting feelings, uh, love and hate and fear and desire. <clears throat> why, do, why do people, so many people like to go to these uh, blockbuster films where there's just one exciting event after another? <laughs> and, and a bit of busy, uh, you know, like bombs exploding and cars speeding through New York City in a way that, you know, it's impossible or it's <laughs> shooting guns, a lot of uh, sex and violence. Why, why do we want to pay money to go in and look at that? Because it excites the mind. It's entertaining. Even horror films or, <clears throat> you know, monster films, are, they, they can be scary, they can frighten us but it's entertaining. Whereas so much of life, ordinary uh, lay life, is, is just routine, isn't it? Waiting for the bus, cooking the dinner, um, waiting for somebody to come home, watching television, um, getting dressed, taking a bath, and so forth. Just the mundane ordinariness of life where in uh, blockbuster films there's one shocking, exciting, magnificent explosion one right after another. And then there's Bodhiwana Monastery, <laughs> where you don't come for that, you don't want that. And so like this weekend retreat is <clears throat> is for reflection, for encouragement, because as Buddhists we, with some, we have faith, we have, we appreciate, the, it's, for many of you, it's your uh, native religion. You're born into Buddhist societies, Buddhist communities, Buddhist parents. For many of us, it's something we've adopted. We've came to not through through our culture or through our parents, but through interest and the arising of interest and faith in Buddha Dhamma. But it brings us together and then the teaching is about the way things are rather than try, trying to arouse discontent in you by complaining and telling you how you should be or how life should be, uh, and then arousing anger and resentment in, in the fact that there's so many injustices and events of unfairness and problems in the world that you know we shouldn't have. We should all just love each other and be kind and and share our wealth, and we can think of the shoulds, how things should be. But pointing out, this is the way it is at this moment. It can only be like this. It can't be what it should be as some ideal, but it is the way it is. So this is a very honest and direct knowing. All of us, everyone here knows how things should be, how Australia should be, how 
Buddhist monks should be, how Christians should be, how the government, uh, the city council, how everything should be. We can all think of, you know, the ideals. But it's the wisdom factory where we're looking at the way things are rather than towards idealizing condition phenomena to something that it should be, but, can't, but isn't right at this moment. And this way of reflecting then is, is not kind of just bowing to mediocrity or, or resigning yourself to, to suffering, but it's, it's a very reflective, investigatory ability we have to observe the Bhutto, these words, Buddha, it's Buddha that knows Dhamma. And our refuge in Buddha then is, is we're, we're letting go of our own egos, our personalities, our views and opinions to be, to take refuge in awareness. To be Bhutto, you have to let go of the ego. It's not like my Bhutto and your Bhutto are different. But taking refuge in Buddha then gives us, we're, we're in that realm where wisdom can operate and inform consciousness in, in the daily lives, in, in the ordinariness of our lives. Sitting, standing, walking, lying down, breathing, just the most ordinary activities that we do throughout the day and night. So the sitting posture, there's four postures, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. Sitting posture is like this. Now when I say that, it's pointing, not telling you how you should be sitting, but observe the reality of, the, of this body sitting on the seat is like this. <clears throat> so we're establishing a sense of here and now, Pachubana Tama. Pachubana, Pachuban, Pachubana means here and now, present. The reality of now is like this. Breathing. Inhaling is like this, exhaling is like this. It's very ordinary. There's nothing kind of mystical or abstract about it or difficult. It's so ordinary we, we never do it. We don't notice. When we sit we, we think or read books or knit or eat something, <laughs> talk to our friends. When we stand, walk, lie down, these are just, you know, we're doing this throughout the day and night of changing these postures, but we're never really with the physical body in its movements because we're thinking about something when we're standing, walking, lying down, going to sleep. So in the next hour, the, 
the walking practice is changing, shifting from the sitting posture to standing and walking. So then the awareness is around the standing is like this when you're standing still. You can feel your your, your feet on the ground in the sense of balance. You can be aware of the breath, breathing in, breathing out. But you're informed, like like you're you're mentally noting, standing is like this. So it's not me standing, uh, performing the standing posture. It's but it's st uh, intuitive kind of recognition of the reality of standing is like this. And then walking. <clears throat> Be aware of the right foot, left foot. The reality of walking is like this. So you're, you're informing, you're noticing that which you're doing, which is happening here and now. No longer from the ego level of I'm standing, I'm walking, but from the Dharma level of standing is like this, the body standing is like this, the body walking is like this. Then the, the practice of walking jongrom, we use the word jongrom, is, is the meditative walking practice. We generally uh, have like 25, 30 steps of our own steps. Uh, and we, we designate uh, John Grom path. I usually recommend 25 to 30 of our one's own ordinary paces. And um, you're, you're noticing that this is, for the next hour you'll be walking between this point and that point. So, you know, the tendency to walk is to go somewhere. And to, to, you're going from here to your, to your, where you're staying, or from here to the dining hall. There's a sense of walking is, the purpose of walking is to, is to go somewhere. To get somewhere. Where walking Jongrom is just going from one point to the next. Walking back and forth. Well, ordinarily, we don't do things like that. We don't, unless we're upset and we're kind of waiting in, in the ICU of a hospital, waiting to see what, what, what's happening, we walk back and forth. But that's more or less out of restless desperation. But walking Jongrom is, is meditative practice. And you're, you're being with the reality of walking and standing during this time. And you're paying attention to it. It's like this. And the mind will, when we're walking, we, to be just aware of walking, we don't generally are unaware of walking unless it's, it's walking is painful or difficult. <clears throat> so we, concentrate on, the, notice the, the movement of our feet, the right foot, left foot. We can use puto, pu for the right foot, to for the left foot, and just to, to stay with the moment. Puto is a uh, mantra to stop the, the wandering mind to focus on what's actually happening, like the, the walking of your own body from this point to that point, and turning, walking back and forth. <clears throat> so, 
So this also leads, you know, this one can get very concentrated through walking jongrom, through walking meditation, but also in, in terms of vipassana, it, it's, it's, it's investigating, looking at the way things are. We notice how, how easily the mind wanders when we're walking. To be pulled out and to look at a kangaroo or a flower or a beautiful bird. It's, it's a sightsee to, to take pictures of the scenic views around. Just notice all these, these tendencies towards distraction and, and, and don't be critical of yourself and just notice how when you're walking you tend to, to uh, think like this or be distracted by that. And then determine to bring your attention to the actual walking practice. So your, your intention is to stay with the, just the reality of standing still and then walking from this point to that point, turning, standing, walking back and forth. So it's very simple, as is your intention. <clears throat> then your habit tendencies will take over. You'll start wandering, thinking, getting restless, uh, wondering if you're doing it all right or what's the point of this walking back and forth we start doubting it that this is a waste of time or whatever it's all the thinking process the sankaras are you know our our personalities our views and opinions arise <clears throat> but <clears throat> in terms of vipassana we're noting that they are what they are they arise and cease don't don't get caught up in just trying to suppress or, or believe in them, but be aware that, that during this time that's been designated, the standing walking practices, this is all that's necessary. Then the, then the awareness, you can concentrate, but if you can't concentrate very well on walking, then reflect on the, tendency to the whatever you're feeling, whatever you're thinking uh, while you're doing this practice, seeing it in terms of it is what it is. And let it be that way, then return to the, to the say, the re uh, reality of walking is like this, right foot, put left foot toe like that so that you're you're not just <clears throat> thinking and analyzing but you're observing and concentrating Now the techniques are simple enough, so it's not, you know, whether some people have, uh, like Ajahn Chah, when I first met him, I'd been trained in the Burmese style, the Mahasi Sayadaw method, where every movement is very slow, where you, you notice every movement of your foot lifting and extending, touching, and you move incredibly slowly. Uh, and that's how I was trained in the beginning. And when I went to Wat Bapolam Pacha, I said, develop awareness around ordinary pace. 
because that's what we use in ordinary life, isn't it? We, you can't walk slowly like that in daily life. <clears throat> I mean, if you have to catch the bus, <laughs> you can't move that slowly, you'll never make it. And where, say, ordinary pace, like Lung Po Cha was always emphasizing around the ordinariness of things rather than uh, very highly stylized or affected ways of, of practice. When I was a Samanera, this is before I met Ajahn Chah, I was staying at a monastery in Nongkai where they, this kind of practice, Mahasi practice was, was being taught and the monk, there was another, there were only two of us practicing this. And uh, the monk, I was, a, had the kuti across from mine, and he'd been there about 11 months. And they were, and they were all praising, saying, he, he really, every movement is so precise, is aware of every movement. When he eats, it takes him forever just to, bring the food, put it into his mouth, and then be mindful of chewing, swallowing, and so forth. I used to watch him, and uh, the monks there were praising, this is their number one student. So I found myself trying to, <laughs> to be like him. Because, <laughs> you know, the ego wants to think that's the, the role model for walking meditation. And, uh, but I found out that, that moving slowly for several weeks like that, I became constipated. <laughs> <laughs> Which created other problems. <laughs> and then one day an ambulance came and took this monk to the hospital. <laughs> So, I mean, it's not to condemn the method, but also we have to use wisdom with it, you know, and common sense that the body does, you know, the, like Lung Po Chao's whole way of training was about ordinary movement, not extreme kind of uh, ex expressions or techniques. And he would use, like, the Thai word for ordinary, tamada, and I'd hear this, word when I was trying to learn the Thai language and I could hear Lung Pa saying, Ben Tamada, Tamada. And I thought, well, I asked the monk, what does Tamada mean? And he said, ordinary. And so this is, uh, and, and Tamada is also the word Dhamma, meaning like the Dhamma is ordinary. It's not high and special and and so refined that, <clears throat> you, you know, it's it, only the the most uh, highly evolved human beings can possibly know Dhamma. It's here and now Dhamma, it's reality, it's breathing, it's feeling, it's sensitivity, and then the awareness of it, of Sankaras, is the way to be free from the limitations that we put on ourselves through ignorance, through avicca, through not understanding Dhamma. So that's why the Buddha's teaching is, is for, what is for minutia, for human beings. Because we have this reflective ability. We are aware of what we're, what we're thinking or what we're feeling. It's like this. <clears throat> so if somebody makes you angry, insults you, and you feel anger rather, you know you're angry. There's anger. When the cat gets angry, it becomes an anger, totally angry. It becomes an angry cat. We become an angry human being. Or, if we're reflecting on it, we know that anger is like this. You see the difference? The Buddha reflective ability 
to to observe. It's 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 where the 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 cat that gets angry can't reflect on anger. It becomes the anger itself. We we tend to do that too. When anger rises, we become angry. But we also you have to admit you know that you're angry, and but you see it as as a self, as your anger, rather than anger is like this. So in vipassana practice, you're no longer claiming the anger uh, and judging yourself as uh, you know, or or getting carried away by it, but observing it is a feeling, isn't it? It's a strong. It affects the your physical body. It's a strong emotion. It lingers even when you stop thinking. You still feel this 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 uh, uh, remaining sense of anger because it, it has a strong effect just on the on the on the body itself. So it requires patience to bear with, say, strong emotions. But the knowing of those emotions from the Buddha level is is no longer claiming it in terms of my anger, my greed, my fears, but observing it in terms of sankhara, Buddha knowing the nature of sankhara is impermanent. One of the common questions in retreats is somebody will say, how do I, uh, I get angry, I have an anger problem, how do I get rid of anger? And so, I could say, well, you know, be more patient or <laughs> try to, Analyze why is it we get why do you get angry so easily or why are you were offended by this? And we ask the question why and become interested in in analyzing why I get angry. But the Buddha never in the scriptures never asked why. He never asked that question. He's pointing to the way it is. Anger is like this. You don't need to know why, but you need, but to know anger is like this. And you see the difference. When you start asking why I get angry, and whose fault is it, or what's wrong with me, or sometimes we feel guilty about it, we've been told we shouldn't get angry, <clears throat> or that we're an angry person, that we we have an anger problem, then it becomes personal, it becomes a self view, uh, and then we start analyzing why. Because you know, I was born under this particular astrological sign where you're supposed to get <laughs> angry, <laughs> anger sign, or I've got a strong fire element, or my father used to beat me up and. And things like this, so we we analyze. But notice in vipassana, it's not it's not about why, but noticing the way it is. Like whatever uh, your emotional habits are, you know, it's not they are what they are. Then they're in sankharas. The encouragement that I'm encouraging you to trust your awareness of them in terms of. Puto tamo sanko, rather than in terms of 
of analyzing them and, and uh, evaluating them and, and, and continually identifying yourself with, your, with the emotions you're experiencing. It's not to suppress emotion or deny it or to dismiss it, but to know it in terms of what it actually is in the here and now, the Pachubana Tamma. <clears throat> so we can plea in here <laughs>